when most of the lands of Earth were still under water, about 3.5 to 3 billion years ago, only about a billion years after the planet formed. In the lava ducts, in the rifts between the plate tectonic continents, which rose upward like fingers from the ocean floor, jetting massive streams of bubbles. Right at the lips of these, in the very hot, boiling waters around the inside edge of these, there arose the first microbes. The lands would go on to rise up out of the sea, and the microbes would fill the entirety of the Earth's ocean, making it a fully functional ecosystem for abundant microbial life forms. However, aeons are passing while all this is going on, day and night, night and day, warmth and cool and light and dark, and always the exact same stars all rush by in the blink of the sky. Eventually the microbes became sponges. These sponges became cnidaria, jellyfish which would evolve into starfish, and anemone which would evolve into seaweed and, perhaps, flatworms. Flatworms would give rise to trilobite echinoderms, and these trilobites evolved into shrimp and brine. The shrimp evolved into lobsters and fish, the lobsters evolved into crabs and sand fleas, and the brine, plankton, and anemone into seaweed. Seaweed and horseshoe crabs emerged onto the land. Up until this point, when all life teemed in the sea, there had been no border to evolution. The struggle for survival was easy, so adaptation was slow, and diversification of appearance abounded. However, now, life evolved from the trench microbes was faced with the difficulty of new necessity. Here is where we probably come to the first global cataclysm. One possible postulate is that autotrophs and heterotrophs, that is, those things which feed off of other things similar to themselves, and those things that feed off of things fundamentally different from themselves, might actually descend from a division between earthly and alien origins. In any event, the weak photosynthesis of seaweed became the strong photosynthesis of Precambrian oak, while the crab and flea gave way by mutation to all species of dinosaur and insect. Notice that, rather than diversity in individual shape or appearance, these life forms bred new traits for the species, which were then infinitely repeated in each generation, and these templates changed in shape or appearance almost as often as with each generation. The reason for this was twofold, and indicates the probable nature of the global cataclysm. If an asteroid had struck the Earth when these first species drifted up from the primordial soup, it would have probably upset the crust and the atmosphere most. The result would have been the fracturing of the mantle and the beginning of continental drift below, and EM disturbances and the blackening of the sky above. I believe this asteroid to essentially have become the mass continental shelf we today call Antarctica. It is likely the mineral deposits there that have caused it to move toward the opposite magnetically charged pole. If, as I suspect, that asteroid did harbor an alien life form, then that life form would have to have been the first virus. Thus, life in those times was ever changing and hostile. The dinosaurs had highly developed thalami, but little to no development of the cerebral cortex, much like modern day lizards. They grew in size due to the intense radiation both caused by the tectonic shifting as EM disturbances along fault lines and by the thinning of the atmosphere at high altitudes due to the ash of the last meteor and the constant subsequent volcanic activity leading to global warming similar to, though to a much more extreme extent, what we are now suffering from due to chlorofluoridation of the ozone layer. 
At the time, this would have worked itself out due to the rotation of the Earth. Just as the ash content was pulled towards the equator at its uppermost altitudes, so the warm air trapped in the atmosphere followed, until finally there was global cooling, and the polar ice caps began to descend. Meanwhile, life went on, more or less obliviously, multiplying and diversifying. The dinosaurs sired mammals and birds. The first of these such mammals was a Cylodon, a mammal that walked like a lizard, with its legs off to the sides of its body, and had a full body tail. As to the dinosaurs, many of them, such as velociraptors and pterodactyls, started to grow feathers and hollow bones to help them maintain less weight during flying. Then, 65 million years ago, there was another global cataclysm. To this day, we do not know for certain what happened to the dinosaurs. We only know that some event devastated the surface of the Earth, destroying all these majestic creatures and sparing only the lowliest of serpents to crawl before the face of the titmouse and the mosquito. If there was an asteroid, it would have had to be much smaller than the last one, because it did not destroy the trees and plants. I therefore propose that it struck where the modern Bermuda Triangle is, and that the distortion to compasses there is the result of the asteroid's massive amounts of minerals and ores, this would have been in the space almost directly between the modern-day Yucatan and Florida peninsulas, then on the western shore of Gondwana land. There is evidence of a 300-foot crater in the Yucatan Peninsula, which at that time was underwater, as well as accompanying remains in modern Cuba of a 900-foot tall sediment deposit carried in by the resulting tsunami. By this time, the lands of Gondwana land, which would become North and South America, Europe and Greater Asia, and Laurasia, Africa, India, Australia, and Eastern Asia, had been parted wide and the sea flowed in between them. Even then, mysterious forces were acting on a global scale. Ice ages came and went. A woolly mammoth recently discovered flash frozen in Siberia had in its stomach undigested tropical vegetation. The most probable theory is that, if an asteroid did hit the planet at this time, it triggered a rapid ice age, which did not allow dinosaurs the necessary time for adaptation to random mutations in natural selection, and which rapidly grew the mammals from the tiniest shrews to the largest mastodons and whales. Then there was a revolution in Africa. Some monkeys next to a brush fire that burned off a certain weed decided to get down out of the trees and start walking around exclusively on their hind legs. We know our ancestors were Australopithecines who lived in southern and eastern Africa five to one million years ago. Homo habilis, who cohabitated these lands 2.5 to 1.6 million years ago. Homo erectus, who crossed the equator in Africa into the north and spread west as far as the Atlantic and east as far as the Pacific and East Indian Oceans 1.7 million to 200,000 years ago. The pre-Neanderthals 600,000 to 230,000 years ago, and Neanderthals, 230,000 to 35,000 years ago of Europe, and Cro-Magnon hunters of Europe and Canada from Africa through Israel beginning 117,000 to 95,000 years ago, all walked the earth before our modern Homo sapiens. It is likely the Cro-Magnons and the Neanderthal were the father and mother species of modern Homo sapiens. Australopithecines first migrated out of Antarctica and into southernmost Africa five million years ago, and Homo sapiens migrated up from Antarctica to Africa 100,000 years ago, 
and again from Antarctica up to South America 33,000 years ago. We presume these species to be descended from interbreeding between species of monkeys, such as apes, chimpanzees, and gorillas, who were themselves originally derived from small mammals such as lemurs, who took to the trees at least several hundred thousand years before. Lemurs evolved through cats from weasels, who had evolved from the first mammals. Rodent-sized furry lizards, with their legs square to the sides and full-body tails that first appeared about the time of the end of the larger dinosaurs from smaller lizards and snakes. However, we have not publicly found either missing link between wombed mammals and their egg-laying ancestors or between early hominids and the family of the monkey which, considering the level of our species' technological development, is probably about an equivalent evolution. As for the absent interspecies leap between egg-laying and wombed animals, are of note the platypus and marsupials, such as the kangaroo. The platypus, which lays eggs, is a genetic link between birds with its flat, round bill and mammals with its coat of soft brown fur. The kangaroo resembles a large erect rodent like a jackrabbit with strong back legs on which it hops and short underdeveloped front legs like the Tyrannosaurus rex. It carries its young after birthing them from its womb in a pouch on its undercarriage until they are fully developed. This clinging of the youth to the underbelly of the maternal parent is also seen in koala bears, sloths, and certain types of monkeys and primates, and differs markedly from the nurturing behaviors of other animals, such as the pelican and the lion, which carry their young in their mouths. The platypus, kangaroo, and koala bear are all native to Australia, the closest island continent to Antarctica, while the primates are native to Africa and South America, and lions and tigers to Africa and Asia, respectively. As to the missing link between early hominids and the apes, monkeys and primates, it is possible that this stage in evolution occurred on the continent of Antarctica, at a time when, again, because of ash content and volcanic activity saturating the equatorial atmosphere, in the wake of the cataclysm that killed the dinosaurs, there was no polar ice cap. It is equally possible that the remains of the first Homo sapiens would be found there, flash frozen, before they were forced in their seafaring boats to the tip of South America, where the earliest fossils of the Homo sapien population exist in the Americas. A 14,700-year-old campsite has been found in modern Chile, and a 13,500-year-old skeleton has been found in modern Brazil. The Cro-Magnons living to the north in modern Canada, Paleolithic artifacts of Clovis people 13,000 years old, the 13,000-year-old Arlington Spring skeleton, and a basket dating back 12,900 years show their presence from one coast to another. And up to modern Cape Town, South Africa, as well as around the Horn of Africa and up the Nile to Ethiopia. By the time of the last ice age, most of the continents were in the positions that we know them today, and so we can trace the route our human ancestors took as they populated the lands of Earth, even on a modern globe. Of the Homo sapiens, first there were the Negroes of Africa, Next, the Australoids of the bush. Then followed from the interbreeding of these, the Mongoloids. Then there were the Americans who were interbred between the elder native Homo sapiens of coastal South America and the migrating Homo sapien tribes who journeyed over the Beringian land bridge between modern Siberia and Alaska around 16,000 years ago. Finally, the last tribes migrated into Europe, which had been occupied by Cro-Magnons, 
and these Europeans then spread through Upper Asia, becoming known as the Caucasians. It was, however, probably not until the middle of the spreading of the Caucasoids, at the end of the last Northern Ice Age, that any of these different races began to lose their thick mammalian coats of fur, which protected them from Ice Age conditions, and only then that their genetic traits of difference in physical appearance such as skin color, began to become visible. By 20,000 to 18,000 years ago, mankind had finally settled in all the lands of Earth. At this time, the negatively magnetically charged pole was in the north, and this caused the electrolysis, or ionization, of the Arctic Ocean, forming one-mile-thick glaciers of distilled salt water that covered northern Europe and much of North America. These decreased sea levels by as much as 300 feet, leaving land bridges connecting India and the Orient to Australia and Eastern Asia to North America. There may have also been land bridges connecting Australia to Antarctica, which would have been only a semipolar, temperate continent free of the ice sheet formed by the negatively charged pole. A land bridge also might have connected Antarctica to South America. The strong electromagnetic field served as a filter for cosmic radiation and was the exact source of evolutionary stimulus the cerebrum needed. Therefore, the earliest civilizations humanity constructed were monumental in scale, economically pro-free trade, and politically democratic. They arose as a network of global coastal trade communities between 22,000 and 7,000 years ago.